All right, welcome, guys, to the uh, May meeting for the Middle South chapter of the GGDA. If you're in Atlanta and Athens watching, welcome. Uh, we're going to have a discussion on what makes, a, what makes a good game. And shout out to our officers out in Japan. If you guys are watching, thank you. Uh, that means you guys found some form of internet on the road somehow. <laughs> um, another shout out is to our CSU chapter treasurer. Peyton Hinton, today is his birthday. Happy birthday, buddy, for watching. So no, we're not gonna we're not gonna sing happy birthday or anything like that. <laughs> we're just we're gonna let them be, cause cause they are a day ahead of us. <laughs> so, a uh, couple of announcements. Um, we are invited to watch a live stream at Atlanta on June fourteenth at seven p.m. Uh, Blue Mammoth is uh, their special host. They are actually a sponsor of SimFest. Uh, they are giving us stuff to give out to you guys. They're giving us codes for their game, Brahalla. So we're encouraged to watch their stream. If we get enough interest, we can watch it here. So, um, SimFest. Who all is excited about that? July 16th. Uh, keynote speaker, former EA sound director, Jesse, Jesse James Allen. Uh, he has a trailer posted on YouTube and it's flying around Facebook and been to mass emails and everything, so check it out. He's got a, a very good talk going on. Uh, I have to, I haven't, don't have it rigged on here. So, I, uh, uh, featured speakers uh, from high res, we've got Scarlett Dangerfield. She is a uh, recruiter for there. So she's coming in and doing a talk on breaking in. Some other speakers are Casey Erdman. He's doing a uh, cybersecurity talk on gaming. Uh, Matt Franklin is doing a panel with Andrew Greenberg and Jesse James Allen. And then Andrew Greenberg, our executive director, is doing a talk on how to start a company. Dr. Rodrigo Obando will be doing a talk with uh, Jordan Huffman, who is an alumni. And Anthony Obando will be doing a talk. We ha do have two open slots for talks that we're trying to fill up. So it's uh, from here till June 15th is first come, first serve. Uh, sponsors for SimFest, Ring Tupa Link, RRO Design, GameStop, Lemongrass Thai and Sushi, Hi Res, Tripwire, and Blue Mammoth. Uh, admission $5 for students, so that's high school and college students with your ID. Uh, CUSU alumni, so uh, basically find me and I'll vouch for you. And G if you're a GGDA member, $5. Everyone else, 8 bucks. We do have a logo. So that is a uh, thanks to our graphic artist, Ashton. So. <laughs> I need to wait for the rest of the officers to get back so we can discuss some things. <laughs> As I said, four of them are in Japan and one of them is in, well, California. Or leaving some point. <laughs> He's on, I know. <laughs> you want it, he wants to do a talk. <laughs> Logbook. <laughs> um, the next meeting will not be streamed because we are doing a special showing on Friday, June 24th of the Imitation Game. That will start at 6.30 and go to about 9 o'clock. Popcorn and drinks will be provided. And we'll be collecting money for pizza for those that want pizza. So if you have not seen it, I highly recommend it. It is uh, Academy Award nominee movie. Very good. And if you're a CS major, definitely watch it. Other than SimFest, who knows what else is going on in July? Well, we're having a Super Smash Brothers tournament, so if you guys want to come show your skills, uh, $2 to get in and play. Hosted by GameStop, they're donating a $30 gift card for the winner. And may go up depending on how things go with our partnership with them. So that's on a Friday. Uh, it's going to be from 5 to 9. Should be a fun time. So who's ready to discuss what makes a good game? Um, I think we all are.
So we're going to, we do have this board to use. We're going to be writing on it. We're going to be putting all the different aspects of the game. But first things first, what are some of the things in a game that we all know that should be in it? Gameplay. Gameplay. <laughs> Players. Story. Visuals. Hey, guys. Leveling system. Mechanics. Let's see what our chat has to say. All I'm hearing, all I'm seeing is Bob Ross. <laughs> Bob Ross. So. Memes. Um, sound design is another one. Audio, you gotta have that. Uh, voice acting, if your game requires that. Engine, yep. Yeah. Yeah, no. Lost your thought. Easter. Who wrote that one? Tyler. Uh, Tyler. <laughs> Easter eggs. So, what Ashton's gonna do is we're gonna color code every different part of the game: audio, writing, and everything. And when you come to write something up here, you're gonna use that color too. Specify what it is. Exactly. <laughs> so. All right, pretty. Yep. I say we keep it. like right here, and then we just use this whole entire board to analyze. All right. So. <laughs> so right is writing. Sound design, voice acting, criteria, yeah, whatever. Criteria takes a lot of skill to do good Okay. Another thing of discussion. Have there ever been any games you guys played that just lack in different areas? Like just Titanfall. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So much hype behind it, so much, you know, Let's hope they, uh, they live the expectation a little higher with Titanfall 2, right? Yeah. Any other games that you guys feel is like a giant letdown? <laughs> That's not even out yet. <laughs> it's been delayed. That g No Man's Sky has been delayed again. After the expansions, too? Anything else? You don't know. I don't know. We said a lot of things. I don't know either. What did we say? Program or question. Those are like the general UI. UI. Yeah. AIs, oh, yeah. UIs. Yeah. 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 AI, AI, then UI. And then UI. UI is separate. Two separate ones. Oh now, how about a game that you guys just said absolutely was like perfect, amazing, like best thing you've? Are we gonna get disagreed with about this? The rocket, because it's simplistic. Oh yeah. Rocket League, Last of Us. I love, I've played them all. I've played them all. We have a, we have a few from the chat. 
What did he say? We have Infinite Warfare was a letdown. That's like, <laughs> 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 Infinite Warfare's not out yet. <laughs> Will be, sorry. I put the wrong pins. Okay. <laughs> and Overwatch uh, was perfect, and also Halo Combat Evolved. We got an eraser. Oh, okay. Game? Soma. Soma? Just put miscellaneous and we'll fi- go from there. Conquer's bad fur day. <laughs> Conquer's bad fur day. Even the multiplayer was pretty decent. On that line, though, we've got to nominate so many different domains. Oh, yeah. So. There we go. Our different categories. You guys move. Oh, uh, leveling. See, if you want to, if you want to talk breaking games, the master is not here. Uh, he's in Japan. Daniel Rockwell. He is the master of breaking anything. <laughs> Dead serious. Dead serious. But but there's one thing that I that I did that he he's just like he can't even. Yeah, I basically I destroyed. I broke Destiny. There was a boss. I took his health down so fast that the game was so confused. It was supposed to teleport me in five different places. It couldn't do it. It kept me in the same place all five times. It was like. What do you do? I'm like, I don't know. So, we got all these categories. What we're gonna do? You guys can uh, come up, write stuff, and explain what you wrote underneath the category and stuff. Uh, this is just basically team building. We're working together as a team to put underneath all of these uh, what makes a good game. So, as you see, writing, sound design, criteria, programming, at UI, anything, miscellaneous. Have fun. Uh, well, for all of them, I have something that works for all of them. It has to fit the design. It has to fit the game. Whatever you do, the mechanic, the uh, AI, the programming, the design, the writing, it all has to fit together to unify, to to give the right feeling of the game. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if if Tyler can hear him from where he's at. <laughs> so anyone want to come up and talk, do stuff, you know, we're uh, what are we t- discussing? What makes a good game, you know, and then we have all these topics that we can discuss and you can write things down underneath. Tells a story. Yeah, that's definitely a big one. Yeah, storytelling's a big one.
Tetris. <laughs> so, so I think I'm pretty much gonna call Ashen up just for the writing portion. <laughs> Make or break the game. <laughs> so you have to focus on narrative. What pers well, narrative and perspective, they kind of fit in together. Like, what angle are you shooting for as a developer? What kind of story are you telling? And you have to focus on your player. Like, where are you nesting in the game their perspective? What can they know? What can't they know to make the game function? Because it's what you don't know that pushes you and has those plot questions that make you want to keep playing because you, you want your answer. You have character development, and that ties into plot. Characters are plot. Plot is not, well, plot, that doesn't make the character. The characters make the plot, because it's their objectives, their motives that, <sighs> it's their objectives and their motives that push them to create that plot. <laughs> like, <laughs> what do you say? Point it toward your face. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> speech, not my forte. We would have better <laughs> anyway, but uh, basically the characters, they're what make the plot make sense. Because, I mean, for example, you're the player, you have to go rescue a princess, but why? Like, what makes you care enough to rescue this princess? She has to be a well-developed character for you to care. Or say you see an NPC there in your place in that same position. Well, why are they doing that? And answers, there has to be them. And just because it's not answered, just because it makes the plot work the way the writers want it to, that, that's not enough. It has to make sense from a character perspective. 
as to why they're doing it. And also dialogue, it's a good representation of character. It will make you believe that they're actual characters, people. That's about it. So, who wants to come up and talk about another topic that I know Ashton wrote all about the writing and all that. All right, programming. My friend put must be efficient. That means don't have like code. When you're programming a game, don't have like over and over again. Plus, when you play a game, you don't want to do the same thing over and over again because it gets boring. So you have to have efficiency all throughout your game. And when you're programming something, I tested multiple times because there was one year in gaming where almost everything was buggy. <laughs> and when the players get a buggy game, they don't want to pre-order it, they don't want to play it. They just got to sit down wait for the day one patch, which it shouldn't be a day one patch for video games, first of all. <laughs> um, and to play their own video game. For example, one game called Tony Stark Pro Skater 5, I think. The patch was bigger than the game itself. <laughs> There's something wrong with your game, and it's still broken to this day. <laughs> There's something wrong with your game. So when you program a video game, make sure it's like tested, make sure it's efficient so we don't have to go through multiple lines of code for no reason. <laughs> and make sure it works, that's with the testing. So that's pretty much it. Just program the game correctly and make it fun and we'll play it. <laughs> Quick question. Raise your hand if you're at Cage. Okay. People that designed for Cage that did the games for that, they did have an alpha and a beta stage. So if when you go into games too, you get to experience the whole thing from the beginning. So you get to test in and out your games and just see and people get to analyze and do all that cool stuff. So, so that's something to look forward to when you go into the games too uh, class here at Columbus State. And in games one, but the big difference is games one by yourself, games two in a group. So, true story. So, who wants to come talk about another topic? Uh, all right, we got Blake coming up. Come on down, the price is right. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a couple things that make a good leveling system. Uh, first and foremost, it should have some reinforcement to it. If I'm going to take the time to play this game and grind to get my character you know, wherever I want him to be, it should be worth it. It shouldn't be the same repetition over and over and over and over and over and over again. It should also be a fair leveling system if you're doing multiplayer aspects. Uh, World of Tanks is a great example. They pair it based on tank levels. They do a great job of making sure you're not some lowly level 3 tank getting smashed by a level 10 tank. Um, it shouldn't be a uh, pay-to-win system either, where I'm dropping money into it, so I automatically get to get the best gear, the best level, stuff like that. I think, what was it, Halo 5 that had a bunch of those microtransactions? Horrible. Horrible stuff. Shouldn't be that way. And what was the last thing? To do oh shouldn't be too easy I shouldn't hit the top level my first day playing the game um, great example Borderlands 2 you know that took some time to level up and it wasn't the same stuff over and over again to do it that's the way leveling should be so we've covered leveling writing and programming anyone else come want to discuss another aspect Part of this, uh, our chat is saying Candy Crush has a lot of microtransactions, and shout out to Day One DLC. <laughs> <laughs> All right, UI. UI is your friend. UI will make or break your game. If your UI sucks, nobody's going to play your game. <laughs> the trick with UI is it needs to be user friendly. Essentially, it needs to be idiot proof. Like, that's basically what you want with your UI. And when you're building a UI, you don't want excessive pop-ups, you don't want walls of text, 
you don't want to pull a Elder Scrolls and make everybody read five page books. Thankfully, that's optional. Um, so basically, when you're building a UI, you need to assume that you've got the attention span of a 10 year old running in there because adults totally have the attention span of a 10 year old when they're playing video games. So if you're going to give them pop ups that block the screen over and over again for your tutorials or whatever, they're going to stop playing. They're going to hate you. <laughs> if you want to give them a pop up every time a quest comes up that they have to go in and close, they're going to stop playing. They're going to hate you. You need a fluid UI. You need it to be image heavy more than text heavy. And you need it to not break. Um, a good example of a horrible UI would be the recent scrap mechanic because it constantly breaks. <laughs> oh god. So the idea of scrap mechanic is wonderful, but the descriptions for every object is a wall of text and the UI is going to constantly break on you. I mean, I tried this game out for my brother or something, but it, um, it's great at first, but after about five minutes of playing, the UI goes semi-transparent and you can't read anything anymore because there's some kind of issue with the graphics driver. And I've tried it on multiple PCs, it does the same thing every time. If someone hasn't had that problem, you're really lucky. But it's bad. That's a good example of don't screw up. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's, the, that's basically what you need to do with UI. Remember, fluidity is your friend. Yeah? Yeah? I'm not sure. Is voice acting part of UI? I think of it as, because, yeah. Yeah. I guess and kind you of. Someone talking to you, more likely to pay to a voice and you are that voice. Yeah, other than pulling a Navi from, from Ocarina of Time. That's an example of a horrible UI because it's constantly, she's coming up, hey, 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 listen to me, listen, <laughs> listen. <laughs> and then she comes up, she's a wall of text. That's a horrible idea. That's a bad UI. Nothing against that game. I love that game, but that's a bad UI. Nobody likes Navi. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> so, so back to the whole Navi thing. The Hey Listen, another game that I played that was very terrible at this. Um, you guys ever play Lego games? Okay, okay. When they first introduced the voiceover to Lego games, uh, which uh, if my brother is watching, he's going to say that is the worst thing to be done ever to a game. Um, in the Lego Batman 2, when they first introduced it, every time you would go and try to get a vehicle or a character, or go into the Batcave or some, something like that, Alfred would say, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? Every single time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so not annoying under UI? <laughs> <laughs> no So, anyone want to come talk about another one? Sound design? I'll take criteria. Criteria? What? Oh, criteria and strengths for 500. <laughs> Is that your final answer? No, I have to say everything in a question if that's the name of the game. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> okay, constraints and criteria. We gotta be doing something, even if you are making up what you're doing. Sandbox games, Minecraft, you're, the objectives are, are self done until they added the ending because people were complaining about the ending, but yeah. Um, time management. Uh, if you're building something for someone else to be doing, you have to have an idea of how much time do you expect the player to be doing this? How much time do you want them to be grinding their Pokemon as they're trying to get to that first gym? How much, how much time do you want, to spend, want them to do that in order for them to enjoy the game? You gotta have these ideas in mind. And target audience. You, everything is built with an audience in mind, but you gotta make sure that everything is coherent for that audience. I guess I know I'm just going bullet point down. <laughs> um, and so you're not going to put 
tons of explicit language, well, you might, and, uh, and uh, game targeted for teens, but the uh, ESRB, is that what they're called? Yeah. Well, would have a problem with that. <laughs> um, Tetris. <laughs> Yeah, it has, the target audience for Tetris is everybody. Um, time management is how much you want to put into it. And objective, don't lose. For those of you on chat, Tetris is a masterpiece that has, because it's gotten its way to this without any storyline whatsoever as an all-time classic game. Well, the addiction could possibly be to the fact that it was so simple and elegant in its design and... Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it was definitely, it's definitely, it's definitely the high, among the highest of the early gaming. Do you have a comment to make on that statement? Hmm. Okay. All right. I'll talk about sound design for a bit. Um, for the ones that are watching from Atlanta, Athens, and all those other areas, if you've been to Siege, you've heard plenty about sound from the fellow sound designers that go. Uh, go to SimFest. Jesse James Allen will be doing a panel on how to do sound. So that is... Uh, that and a few other sound designers like Watson Wu, who took part in Assassin's Creed 3, and a few others. So, fits the story. You want it to fit your story, because I've played plenty of games where a sound effect is just random. Yeah, it's cool to do the Willem scream every so often, but you don't want to overuse it or put it in random games. Uh, music. Yeah, that goes in there. Music. You want, it to, just like a movie, you want it to fit the area. You want it to be going with the game, uh, going to film for a bit, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, any Middle Earth series, they have a perfect film score. I can listen to it again and again and again. <laughs> uh, same with Star Wars. Those are always. Um, one thing I do like, uh, I know Destiny is kind of the game that's been thrown around by a lot of people. The music for that, phenomenal. You know when you're going to a certain planet. You know when you're going up against a certain boss you know when something's going to happen. Uh, I know with some other games, uh, like fright, uh, scare games, you know when something bad's going to happen. Resident Evil. Resident Evil. All right. All right, to, to reiterate, it uh, basically has to feel for the area. You want to have something not boring, and you want it to fit in with uh, whatever's going on. Uh, yeah, you want a variety of sounds. You don't want the same one over and over again. Goes into the next thing, sound effects. You want everything to be unique. Um, you can make sound out of everyday objects. I've done sound by just swinging a stick and manipulating it and make it sound like a sword. I've done where you grab a pool ball, roll it on the floor, speed it up, warp it a bit. I made it sound like uh, a laser. 
So you, you can do all sorts of cool stuff with that. And that was actually just for a multimedia class where, where the professor said, grab sound that is not copyrighted and design it yourself. So, um, also a good sound mixer is pretty good. If you, if you want to go spend a good amount of money on a sound thing, have at it. But Audacity will do the trick. Uh, there's times where I'm just messing around. Audacity does everything for me. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Uh, so, in order to cover all this, you want it, the music and the sound have to fit the story. Uh, if you ever play Call of Duty, to me, every single gunshot sounds the same. You don't want that. You, you don't want that. <laughs> uh, every other shooter I played, like Battlefield has unique stuff. Destiny, you know when you're going to get killed by a certain gun. <laughs> you know when you're going to die to... Um, a, a notorious thing, a blade dancer. You know when, when you hear the little shh. Oh, yeah, run, run, run. Yeah, and then you know when, when a titan comes up with the hammers, you hear the clicking bell. So uh, certain games have unique things. Uh, in Tomb Raider, uh, uh, raise your hand if you played the new one, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Okay. I'm, I'm actually in the middle of playing it right now. Uh, um, you can tell when certain, when certain creatures are coming towards you. Uh, when you walk over to the plants, you hear your footsteps. If you're walking very slow, you know, footsteps is another one hard to capture. I know a lot of people just walk around and all that. But uh, I, I watch a lot of features on films and sound design and stuff. And by talking to some of these sound artists, the easiest thing is, is you take off your shoes, you put your hands in the shoes, and you just gently walk. You don't want to have that. You want a gentle sound. So we got art, AI, the miscellaneous and design. Who wants to come talk about any of those? All right. Artificial intelligence. <laughs> so we've all had that bad experience with AI. We all know it. We all know the enemy that just walks off the cliff. We all know dog meat that just stands in the doorway. Get, you, I really wanted to kick function just to get him out of the way. It, it's killed me like seven different times. It's terrible. And you know, we all have that weird, you know, reaction such as in Assassin's Creed. It's like, oh, I just jumped into this hay bale. Bye guard. It's like, wait, you just saw me jump into this. So pretty much you want them to react reasonably. You want them to say like, oh, if I was in that person's position, I would do this. And you know, there's a lot of people that appreciate strategic AI, Dark Souls. I mean, holy crap, the combat in that game. <laughs> I know, right? And then I, I've seen like very conflicting things. Like some people don't want it too hard, some people want it too easy, but then again, you know, that's why we have difficulty settings and, and all that, but then, that brings us to our second point, not impossible to kill. A big complaint, I haven't actually played it myself, so I can't say it from personal experience, but The Division, you pretty much get like guys with sunglasses and they're just like, oh, I just emptied a clip into your forehead and you're still standing. And then after I kill you, it's like, oh, 2 XP, cool. <laughs> so pretty much you don't want them impossibly hard, but you don't want them too easy because then it just turns into a prototype where you're just running around slaughtering people with absolutely no incl inclination of what you're actually doing. Uh, that's, a game. that's actually a really fun game though. It's one of the games that AI easy is good. It's weird. So yeah, pretty much you want them to actually act like human beings. And actually, a personal story of mine too, I play TF2 almost uh, 1300 hours now. Yeah, so. Uh, the bots in that game, terrible. Never, never play the bots because it's a, it's one of the few times where I can save Valve screwed up on AI. It's one of the few times I can actually say that because you'll get such weird instances of like, oh hey, why are you just standing there walking into a wall? And oh hey, oh you just blew yourself up. Okay, cool. So yeah, so pretty much name of the game. 
get them to be a nice difficulty for your players and make them act accordingly according to the situation that they are in. Let's see, you in the front. Oh, mm hmm. Oh yeah, Alien Isolation, one of the few times a movie to game and game to movie actually kind of worked. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Alien versus Predator. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And that's kind of like, that's why I bring up the division, because, you know, you emptied an entire clip to his forehead. Well, now you have to go scavenge for ammo, now you have to go heal up, and you kind of did it for nothing, which actually kind of goes back to leveling. AI actually ties very well into the leveling portion of gaming. Yeah, AI, is just, I've played games where the AI is just pain in the butt. Uh, hmm? Yeah, that, that's um, the one game that I played was uh, Fracture. The only reason I bought it was because it was made by uh, uh, Lucas Games, you know, George Lucas' company. So I thought it'd be uh, LucasArts. My bad. Uh, I bought it because, you know, I figured, you know, one of my favorite companies, you know, Star Wars and all that. Yeah. It most pain in the butt, AI, pain in the butt, everything. Made it past the first act, second act, which is like, nope. Let's trade this thing in. So we got design and art and miscellaneous. Anyone? Or design. Art's another good one. <laughs> All right, Jeremy. When I wrote that it implements interesting character designs and backgrounds, I guess I kind of meant that when you're crafting a world for your game, you kind of want your characters to actually fit the world and actually what convey the feeling and emotions that you want for your world and actually attract your target audience. Uh, like one game, Overwatch, that just came out, like it attracted me really well because the characters kind of display the story really well, like how you have their animations about over um, Widowmaker and Tracer and how they have this little spat and or how you have uh, Winston and how he n has known Tracer for a while and they have a nice little, you know, relationship in the game. And then you also want fun level designs in your game so that your characters or your players don't get bored with your game because replayability is a huge aspect of it. Uh, you also kind of want that there's something to be new so that every time a pl character plays that level, they find something new. So that, like when I'm playing Widowmaker and on Overwatch and I go to one of their stages, there's always something else I can do with Widowmaker to make the game more interesting for me and more interesting for other players. When I'm playing a different character, there's always something else that I can do on that stage that makes it really interesting. <laughs> I don't know what to do for Reaper. Reaper always just tears me up on that game. It's like he just magically appears behind you and just like, die, 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 die. Yep. <laughs> now, if you want a great game of uh, design, play Mario Maker. <laughs> That's... All right, we got Bill coming up. What did we? Actually, the more recent part of Code 4. Or hard to keep in mind. You got great stuff up here. You've got. Oh, I'm sorry. Design, leveling, this. Well, miscellaneous, I guess, covers everything, right? But the thing is, lately, with the the advent of the player, right? So, what makes good game? So, I sit there and think to myself, everyone who comes to a game, they want different things from it. You said yourself you like uh, sports games. Another person likes leveling, you know, character building or whatnot. Everyone who goes to the game wants to get something different from it. 
So the thing is, to me, a, a great part of the game that you have to account for is the player. And lately, uh, with uh, the way the games are built now, they put in interesting new, uh, that's where I'm looking for, uh, challenges with like uh, Dark Souls. So the thing is, the other players actually step in and make the challenge for the other players, or they can help them. Um, let's see. Uh, I've seen in Doom where actually players can make their own levels and bring that into it. I haven't seen, I haven't actually seen it work yet. They said some sort of soul forge or forge so they can uh, actually share dungeon levels with their friends. Um, actually, players can make or break your game. Uh, I don't know if y'all are, y'all are probably too young for this, but uh, there used to be the first online game, which was Ultima Online. Uh, it was a big, <laughs> A big experiment. It cost about two million dollars to make by Richard Garrett and Origin. And uh, on the first day, they learned exactly what an impact the players would have to an online world. And what happened was Richard Garrett was going to go out to this mass of people he had online and give a speech as the King uh, British, Lord British. And when he stepped up on stage, they had these, these things set to where uh, one player couldn't kill another player. And he went out there, you know, with the, the thought that he would go out here and do this great speech and the game would start. And when he did so, what he didn't account for was another player who was able to cast a spell, which created a wall of fire. And since the wall of fire was an in-game object that was attached to the player, it immediately killed Richard Garrett on the spot. And that was the end of his speech. <laughs> <laughs> True story. So. The thing is that as time goes on, the player or players get to be more and more part of the design or more part of the game. And I find that the more interest in things like the, in Dark Souls, where you can add an element of surprise by just allowing another player to step in your world, adds a great deal to the game. Very well said, Bill, very well. So, last two topics, you know, the miscellaneous and art. All right, we got Ashton. I've learned how to hold a mic since then. <laughs> it's a learning process. So we'll talk about art, the visuals, and how that makes the identity for the game. Everything you see in games, there's an image for it, from, say, the advertising to the cover to the actual game. And I guess you can tie in the animation and concept art under this, but uh, it also plays a major role in setting the mood for the game and what kind of atmosphere you're walking into, which can be complemented by sound design, enemies, all that. And one part of art that I love about games, it would be the concept art. Everything you've seen, there's a concept for it. And there might have been multiple concepts. You never know. Um, behind everything you see, there's been so much poured into that final image. And it's just one of the more unique aspects of art and game design, in my opinion. Good. <laughs> art and writing design yeah you could also put that in programming too Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Cut the check. Producers. So, what we just discussed to reiterate to the audience is that um, the producers have a big say uh, in movies and in gaming. Uh, if the director wants to go a certain way, the producer's like, I want it done this way. So, it used to be that, hey, we provide you the money, not anymore. Uh, and then you have one person designed you know, on every discipline of a game, so that way you're not destroying. Or getting on each other's heads about something. So, so the last thing right here, miscellaneous, hodgepodge, whatever you want to call it. Whatever we could not find a category for. I, I said we just all just jump on on this one. Challenge. Yeah, and I know there you have your different difficulty settings and stuff. Super easy, easy, medium, hard, insane difficulty. Yep. So, starts easy, gets harder throughout throughout the game. Easy to learn, difficult to master. Diablo three. Yeah, that's that's yeah, challenging. Everything has to fit coherent. Well, we we move that over here. Oh, no constraints and criteria. Okay, everything has to fit coherent. We got that's what we got over here. <laughs> Dante must die difficulty. Devil may cry. Yeah, pain in the butt game there right there too. <laughs> Unless you go to comboing. Um, so everything has to fit. You want everything to be smooth sailing, everything to be good, everything to flow. Uh, paint the perfect picture. So from what we were just told, uh, Persona, the first one, 
Uh, you're out there trying as, as the apocalypse happen. Trying, you're saving the apocalypse from happening, and you have all this music. But when you go into the hub, you have like J-pop and all this other music that does not fit in. Not oh, good. Yeah, so it's not consistent. Not f- doesn't flow. Must be fun. Of course, yeah. yeah. So, so let's define fun. Exactly. Uh, it is uh, something that the user enjoys. Something the user is actually willing to invest their time in. That's time investment. So. Something that does not put you to sleep. I mean, I, I do. I have a stack of games at home that I can just play again and again and again. I mean, Rock Band being one of them. I never get bored of that one. Um... There's a few others, but we could be here all night. Civilization. Another one. Let's see what another good one. Racing games. I mean, those can get kind of tiresome after a while. We I mean, need just going around a track. Fighting games. Super Smash Brothers. Killer Instinct. Mortal Kombat. Competition. Competitive gaming. Esports. Let's throw that out there. I mean, I mean, Tyler. Uh, if you were here, he could probably go on for hours about esports right there. Yeah. Replayability. I think that was you. What do you gotta say before Blake? Let's see what Tyler's got. Let's go to the chat. Tyler said, maybe like 10 minutes, not much to talk about eSport world. Yeah, you were just telling me the other day when I was streaming about how you used to do Call of Duty, Halo. Um, let's see. They used to do it professionally and all that. Oh, yeah, that was a nice conversation. That, that's actually in my archive history if you want to watch that one. Um, yeah. Replayability. I know certain story mode, story games. If you just do it, uh, the regular story, you cannot go back and really do anything. Fallout Four. So it wasn't like the other fallouts. Oh, like all like fallouts are in the game. Anything that we can explore the whole Okay. So you, you you gotta be able to go back and have a pretty good story to go again. Like I know certain stories you can choose your your pathway. Telltale, Beyond Two Souls, you can do that if I'm correct. Until Dawn. Life is strange. <laughs> yeah. 
You had your hand up, Ashton? Yeah, I know the one game that did not work. I think they should just scrap the idea. Black Ops 2 for Call of Duty. They should have not <laughs> had a story decision on that one. <laughs> but when they said that, I'm like, so you're saying I have to play your campaign five billion different times to get... No, forget this. <laughs> Far, Far Cry 4 has decision making too. You can choose. You can choose to kill the certain people and choose not to. I don't want to say any spoilers, but depending, actually, in Far Cry 4, depending what you do at the very end, you can get either a very pitiful ending or like, hey, this is good. Oh yeah. The Just sit here and have crab rangoon, right? <laughs> so, so I know, I know. Like every year, E3, E3, it's coming right up. They're always hyping up games and everything. But there's always the one that's like, oh, we're gonna announce it now. Maybe, okay, three years down the line, and it's all hyped up. Two hours of gaming, eight hours. What the heck? Exactly. What's the, what's the last Guardian? I mean, Division was hyped up for how many years? Uh, at least five. At least five. I, I, I had, uh, since leaving high school, I had been talking about trying to, like, whenever it came out, play it with one of my friends, but I'm glad we didn't. <laughs> what we got here on the chat? TF2, shout out to Duke Nukem. Much hype, such failure. Mass Effect 3. <laughs> we have, we, some people in this room are actually still in the first one, okay? <laughs> no, no, no. What just came on the chat? Kingdom Hearts 3 hype. Since 2005, end of 2. Best part about a game was the... Uh, of it was it being a poop-throwing a poop throwing simulator. Uh, what about uh, Fallout 3? <laughs> 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 Battle, Battle... Yeah, it was. The thing is... The thing is... The thing is... The thing is Talking to some of the people that work behind the game, and this is <coughs> Siege, if you go. Uh, I know Jesse was getting all this hype to me, saying, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a Star Wars fanboys that there was one. So, so and, th and that happened to be the weekend of the beta. So if you were at Siege that year, you maybe had one day to play it. <laughs> that was it because uh, hotel internet's not the best. Uh, no, f no offense to whoever books the Marriott. Um, but yeah, we were we had all this hype while we we're at Siege. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, you only had like one or two levels in the beta. Game came out. Oh, we're gonna fix it with DLC. Yeah, I, I need to actually. I'm gonna probably get that DLC to see if they're what they're talking about. <laughs> Cause uh, when I when I play, I'm like, a servers are hard to match make with it, and b, uh, when you try to get into a party and invite people, their their mechanism for that is just like wow. 
Yeah. For Xbox, you mean? Xbox, PS2? Nope. Original. Xbox, not. Okay. Did Rodrigo make that game? <laughs> oh, that's Andrew Greenberg. <laughs> uh, shout out to... This is uh, from Tyler. Shout out to my gig- gigabit internet. <laughs> Oh yeah, hello to our executive director who's watching. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, yeah, Battlefront was you know I was excited because of what ten years since the last game, if I'm correct. And now they're talking about a sequel. I think it's going to be like a Battlefield special, like once every two years or once every year kind of deal with Battlefront. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, what another game that was hyped trying. To <laughs> all right, all right. We're talking about Destiny. Um, according with uh, um, what uh, Valencia said, that she played the beta and like ten, finished ten percent of the game, and yeah, that was it. But I think majority of Destiny is is end game. What you're gonna get at the end? Well, you finish the storyline, you get the raid. Cool. Um, DLC, more story, more story. Raid, raid. Yeah. I mean, new content's pretty good. <laughs> Do you want to come up? to yep. to read what uh, Dr. Obando said uh, he plays to play with family and students so that's the whole reason Destiny he plays that to play with students and family yeah I mean yeah every night there's always um, uh, yeah every night there's not a night that goes by we don't, we don't play no joke <laughs> I mean I can show you my characters and uh, So you're more of a single player. So Assassin's Creed storylines, more you think? Yeah. Okay. No, no offense to the first one. That will got kind of repetitive. It did. I got it. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. All except for, yeah. All of them after that, we got pretty good. So too much of a Skinner's box scenario for Destiny. To reiterate what Bill said, he said uh, the hardcore multiplayer people will drag you to do stuff. They want to finish the story fast, but if you're by yourself, you want to enjoy the story. 
So he uses Skyrim as an example. So by yourself, you won't read every single Skyrim book. But then if you're playing with your friends, let's go to, to this dungeon over here. To, to uh, repeat what Dr. Bondo said, he said, um, you may be watching this in multiplayer games, watching the same thing over and over again, but when, um, to last month's, you're, you're making the story yourself, to last month's topic, streaming, which obviously I'm one of the ones that was in that panel, every time, we may be doing the same raid over and over again, but there's something funny that happens. Someone may mess up and it's like the funniest thing in the world, and then, oh, Peyton Rage, as Ashton points out. If, if you watch it, there's, uh, there's some rage videos on my thing. There's a lot of hysterical stuff. But it, you, when you're not doing the same thing over and over again. Um, I've watched streamers do, okay, let's do this raid five billion times. Let's do this thing five billion times. But the comical part is just watching them do stuff or the reactions to what they do. I believe you had your hand up, Andrew. So co-op split screen games. We're kind of we're fading away from that. That yeah, th those used to be fun. I remember some of the games I used to play with split screen. Uh Diablo when it when it got ported to console, you can have the same people on the same screen. That actually made it a lot more a lot of fun cuz you um you don't have to have separate screens. You can be sitting on the couch having a good time. Uh Gears of War split screen. You know, that's a fun co-op game. Uh even though when I play with my brother we're at each other's heads sometimes. But, you know, that's Lego games. Those are all oh my god. Yeah, as I said, I've played them all. That's like I never get get tired of that. Yeah, something. So, Portal Two, of course. That's uh, Casey said Portal Two. So, so I think we've had a great conversation here. I know one few other things we could have covered. I know, you know, we could have gone in great depth about other issues. You know. Uh, security, but if you come to SimFest, you can hear Casey talk all about that, right? Yeah, so uh, quick wrap up. Yeah, we covered design, leveling, UI, AI, programming, constraints, criteria, sound design, writing, and art. And then we just had a nice conversation about various different types of games and how we enjoy gaming and stuff. Um, so next month, we will not be streaming the meeting. We're going to be watching the imitation game. Uh, that is on. Friday, June 24th. 
from 6.30 to 9. So if you have not seen that film, I highly recommend it. Uh, you know, it's World War II, you playing a game to win a game. Playing a game to win the war. So if come see it again because it's that good. So, and as I said, popcorn and drinks are provided, and we're taking money up for pizza for those that want to have a little extra to eat. Uh, and then, big thing in Ju July, SimFest. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, Jesse James Allen, keynote speaker, few other speakers, uh, Andrew Greenberg, Matt Franklin, Casey Erdman, Anthony Obando, Dr. Rodrigo Obando, and Jordan Huffman. Uh, just to name a few, I'm trying to think if I missed anybody that signed up. Oh, studios. Hi res Studios is coming on. They've given us a lot of stuff to give out. Tripwire is sending us stuff. Uh, Blue Mammoth. Uh, next month or on the 14th. Yep, 14th. Uh, cast your stream on YouTube. Uh, Atlanta is having Blue Mammoth as their as their guest speaker. So they do stream. And if we can get enough people in here, we can watch it on the on the screen over here and. Blue Mammoth made uh, Brahalla, so they're actually a sponsor of SimFest. So, yes, we are recording every single talk. We have two sets of AV people. Tyler Stout is kindly letting us borrow his equipment for to record some of the talks, and Matt Franklin is helping us out too. So we'll have this room we're in with one set of talks, and then 408 down the hall. Chat. Brahalla tournament. Uh, could I get some? The June 14th meeting. Blue Mammoth is doing a Brahalla tournament up in at, at the GGDA meeting in Atlanta. That's in the land chapter, so if you want to go up there and partake in that, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but we'll watch the meeting and what Blue Mammoth has to say. So, uh, but yeah, if you can't make it to SimFest, we will post everything on YouTube. Every talk will be posted, so you won't miss a thing. Uh, but I highly encourage you guys to come. It's a great time to come get to know the other chapters, because we are probably going to have people from the Atlanta and Athens chapter come down to come, you know, see what we're all about down here. And... It's our time to, and, oh no, they're announcing the tournament at the meeting, correction, they're announcing the Brahalla tournament at the meeting on the 14th, so if you want to partake in that, it's actually a lot of fun, so, yeah, so if, come on out next month for the movie imitation game, in July we got SimFest and Super Smash Brothers tournament. Wow, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Emoji on the screen, everybody. So, so we'll see you all next month. Our meeting will be on a Friday. And we'll have early registration for the Super Smash Brothers tournament in a couple weeks. And early registration for SimFest ends July 2nd. We have 20-some people early registered. We are doing registration at the door. And the payments that will be accepted are cash and credit card. So, see you all there. Uh, early payment. Uh, no early, no early pay at the door.